been a long tradition in Southern Baptist churches that January would be devoted to a Bible study. And every year they select uh, one book of the Bible or a portion of the book of the Bible and would go through an in-depth study. I know when I was a child, we would go all week long, you know, two, probably two hours a night, Monday through Friday, and we would study that book of the Bible. And to, to go through Ezekiel in one week was rough, and I remember that one. And I remember the title of it. It's like All Things Good and Weird, or something like that, or Weird and Wonderful. I can't remember the exact title, but uh, when a kid, I remember in the book of Ezekiel, was like that. So that's one thing that I wanted to do as pastor here, is at least take one book each year, and maybe two books. Uh, on Wednesday night, a lot of times, we'll focus on just one book. But to go through a serious Bible study, and so on uh, the next several weeks, we'll be looking at the first three letters of John, first one, two, and three of John, and, uh, and look at those in depth. And they're only about five pages long, uh, but you can, you can never run out of material on just those uh, five pages. On Wednesday evening, we'll be going uh, in more depth and detail, and so if you're going to miss out on something if you don't come on Wednesdays or don't uh, participate in our Zoom uh, meetings. And this week, we'll be meeting in person here in the sanctuary. Also, in, on February 18th, I'll be out on uh, for a week of vacation, and our uh, Minister of Children and Youth, Kate Durbus, is going to be bringing the message that morning, and she will also be talking about 1 John. So I wanted to let you know that was coming, so you can mark in your calendar and make sure you're here. Um, how many of you like roller coasters? How many of you like to ride rides? I know when, how about when you were younger, did you like roller coasters or uh, things like that? I know as you get older, they really make you feel weird. You don't want to do that again. And so, but I remember a couple years ago, our family wanted to go uh, to a theme park or an amusement park somewhere. We looked at Bush Gardens and King's Dominion. And, uh, and you know, you can get YouTube videos of every roller coaster in the United States. You can click on there, say, I want to look at Cedar Point. In Sandusky, Ohio, and see what are they writing now. And there's somebody who has taken their camera and written on the front of that roller coaster and filmed the whole ride. And you can take, uh, you know, any any example you want, and you can find it. Now they don't uh, recommend that you do that, and they highly discourage you from taking your phones on those rides. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see some phones laying there of people that tried to do this and didn't successfully make it through the ride. But I can tell you one thing, we, we decided to go to King's Dominion, and that intimidator on YouTube isn't anything like it is in real life. I, I'm kind of afraid of heights, and I remember slowly clicking up that hill as you go all the way up, uh, you know, over 200 feet, I think it's almost 300 feet high, I forget the actual height of that thing, but I'm afraid of heights, and that was not a good experience for me. And then the ride down, it didn't get any better either, and when you hit the bottom and you hit that curve, you almost blacked out from the G-forces. I think none of that was in the video. And I tell you, the real experience was very much different uh, than what we actually saw and felt. Now maybe some of you at some time in your life, or maybe one of your children at some time in their life, saw a cute little movie or a cute little picture of a puppy or something like that. And maybe there's a calendar in your house and there's little puppies on it. And it just kind of makes you want to go get one, doesn't it? And, and you see that cute little film or movie on it, and then you go get a puppy. But I want to tell you, the real experience of having a puppy doesn't really compare to a picture, does it? You know, when you get a puppy, they're so warm and cuddly. You know, a calendar picture can't do that for you. They sit on your lap, and they just make you feel so good. They look at you with those big out eyes and kind of make you fall in love. You know, the pictures just don't cover all that. And then all of a sudden, you notice a smell or something like that, and you notice, you know, the video didn't cover that either and you gotta clean up a mess. But the real experience of having a puppy is not at all like the pictures. You know, maybe you like music and you listen to music on CDs and things like that. And I like to listen to music when I do things and uh, in the background and maybe the radio or something like that. But if you ever go to a real concert or listen to a choir singer or, or even here at church, the praise team, it's a whole lot different in, in person, isn't it? than it is on the CD or the DVD that you watch. The real life experience of seeing a concert and 
feeling that music and being in the crowd and seeing the excitement and watching all the details and things that are going on is a lot different. It's a lot better than what you get on a CD. It doesn't even compare. Probably a little over 20 years ago, I had the chance to attend a crusade by Billy Graham. And you know, you can see the crusade a whole lot better and hear it a whole lot better on TV. Everything's much clearer. But when you're in the stadium, you know, he's only maybe this big. He's, you know, tiny. And, and he's talking, but you hear it on the speakers. And, and people are mingling around and doing things. The experience is a whole lot different. But you feel the power of the Holy Spirit of those thousands of people all together that are worshiping with him as he preaches and praying for him as he preaches. And the experience doesn't even come close to compare to what you have on TV. Now, it's one thing to experience something for yourself. It's another thing to hear it, hear about it secondhand. Have someone tell you about what they went through or try to teach you the right way to do things when you've never experienced it. And, and, and a lot of times we learn from other people by what they tell us and what they show us. But it's just not the same thing as doing it yourself. You know, we believe in on-the-job training. We believe in doing it yourself to learn a lot, don't we? So it's hard to learn from somebody else's experience. You don't get the same detail as it would be if you go through it yourself. It's quite another thing if you can experience it for yourself. Now the Gospel of John was written by the beloved disciple, is how he calls himself. He doesn't really name himself in the Gospel of John. In the first letter of John that we're going to be studying this morning, he doesn't even name himself. He doesn't say who the, who the letter is written to. He doesn't say who it is from. And then in the second letter, in the third letter of John, it says it's from the elder. The second letter, it says to the, to the lady. And the third letter says to Gaius. And, but the letter is from John the elder, or just the elder. And so people have wondered recently in, in modern scholarship, whether this was really John or which John is this. Now for hundreds of years after these portions of the Bible were written, for about 500 years, nobody questioned who they came from. They, they all believed that they were from John the son of Zebedee. His brother James, you might remember, two disciples that were fishermen that Jesus called uh, to be disciples. And Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder. And for hundreds of years, and almost up to almost 100 years ago, Almost nobody questioned what these were. And I still hold to the traditional view that the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee, the, the sons of thunder, one of the sons of thunder is the one who wrote the Gospel of John, the letters of John, and also Revelation. But it is possible that it was another John and that there was someone else there. But one thing that you get as you read these, that these are all connected. They're all written by people who knew each other, who believed the same things, who talked the same way, used the same language. As you read through these books, you can tell this is like the same person is writing all of these. And they're all connected together. And But even though we don't exactly know who it is, we do know that it, this is an eyewitness of who Jesus was. And he tells us about that. And so I want to read the introduction to the book, the first four verses. John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 4. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and appeared to us. We proclaim to you that which we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. It's not hard to see in just those first few verses that the author of this, and I believe it's St. John or the Apostle John who wrote this, had a definite personal experience with Jesus Christ. He's sharing first-hand knowledge. This is not a second-hand story, but he's sharing first-hand experience about 
he saw Jesus and how God worked in his life. He says, we have heard. We have seen with our eyes. We have looked at. We have touched with our hands. And he says, we proclaim that which we have seen and heard and touched. And we proclaim the word of life. We proclaim the word of life. We want you to know about life because we saw him. We knew him. We knew life was in Jesus. And he says the life appeared and we have seen it. So we testify about it. So John is testifying about what he has seen and heard and touched and experienced. This is a real deal for him. This is not just some secondhand story that he heard in some back alley somewhere. But he experienced this in his life. And then he says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. The eternal life that was with the Father appeared to us. This eternal life is Jesus Christ, is who he's talking about. And he says, we saw eternal life stand before us. Jesus Christ, eternal God, became human flesh and stood before him and witnessed and testified to him. And his life was never the same because he saw Jesus. And he was with Jesus. And he found out that eternal life is a person. It's not a place. Eternal life is Jesus Christ. It's knowing Jesus Christ. And he refers to him as the Son of God who was with the Father. The Son of God who was with the Father and then appeared to us. Now throughout this letter, the Apostle John is going to talk about some very important things. The most important things to him. And you see at the time, others were teaching that some of these things were not true. Some of these things uh, they thought just could not be true. And one of them was that Jesus is really not the Son of God. How could that be possible that uh, God could come and become a man and, and be uh, you know, a Son of God here on earth? But as John writes this letter, he's very clear. He uses the name Son of God for Jesus over and over again. And every time he does that, he uses a Greek word called weos which means son. Every time he refers to Christians, he calls them children. Not weos, not sons and daughters, but he calls them technon, which is children. And so he makes a difference between the Son of God, who is Jesus, and then children of God, who is us. He makes a big difference in who they are. And as you read this gospel, you can see those details in it. But others were teaching different things. And one of the things he also taught is that Jesus really was not the Messiah, that Jesus was not the Christ. And so John has a passage in there where he talks about how the spirit of the Antichrist has come into the world and is teaching that Jesus really was not the Messiah. And so it's like an anti-Messiah teaching or an anti-Christ teaching, that he wasn't the real Messiah that we were waiting for. Teacher, people were teaching that. And so John is sending this letter to make sure that the Christians that are there Realize that Jesus really is the Messiah. Jesus really is the Son of God. It's God come in the flesh. He wants to remind them of that truth. Now sometimes in life, you know, as you, as you go through this world, people deny God, don't they? They live like He doesn't exist. They live like it's not even true. The things they say, the things they do, the things they believe in. And, and you know, it's easy for doubt to creep in. It's easy for churches to change and become more like the world rather than like God, isn't it? And so I think this letter is really good for us today to realize that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is our Lord and He is who we follow. We don't follow Nancy Pelosi. We don't follow Donald Trump. We might listen to them and they're our leaders of our land, but they are not our God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the one who came. He's the one who is eternal. He's the one that we can trust in and believe in. And he starts this with, with the words that that which was from the beginning. And so he says that eternity came and stood before him. And he says that which was from the beginning. And it reminds us of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was God. It reminds us of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And then the eternal word came and became flesh and lived among men. And so in this passage, he's referring to these same things. He's making sure that we know that he's talking about Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, who was with God at the very beginning. 
He's always been with God and he's there at the, at the very beginning. And so he starts this letter making sure we are clear about who he's talking about. That there's no doubt in our life of what he's saying. Now as you read through the book, you can almost divide it into two parts. There's two things that he really talks about. One of them is God is light. God is light. And it goes all through this letter. But mostly in the first half. And, and, and you see, he says that the world is in darkness, but the light has come into the world. The light has come and stood before them, and that we could see because the light came. Now, you cannot uh, live in the light and keep on sinning. That's one of the themes in this book. You cannot live in the light and sin. You can't be part of darkness and say that you're part of the light. You can't follow Christ and continue to sin. And so he's very clear about light and dark, just as the Gospel of John is, just as Revelation is, the book of Revelation. And the second thing that he goes through is love. He talks about God is love. It's mentioned that twice in this short little letter. God is love. And he tells us all about love. And almost everything that's in this little letter is in the Gospel of John, chapters 13 through 17. There's really nothing new that is in 1 John that hasn't already been talked about when the disciples met with Jesus in the upper room, which is in John chapter 13 through 17. And so that's one reason I believe that this is the same person who wrote this. He was there. He heard what Jesus said. And he's sharing this with us. But he says God is love. And, and he says if you follow God, if God lives in you, then you need to be loved too. You can't say that you love God and hate your brother. You can't do that. You can't have God to love in your life and then hate somebody else. If you've experienced God, if you've had a first-hand experience of God in your life, then you're going to love your brother. He's very clear about that in this book. And if you love God, then you will also follow His commands. That's one theme all through the book. And Jesus actually said that. If you love me, you'll follow my commands. That's a direct quote from Jesus Christ. The person who wrote this heard Jesus say this. And if you've experienced Christ in your life, if you have his love in, in your life, then you're going to follow his commands. You will not be able to sin. You won't be able to continually sin over and over again the same kind of things if Jesus is your Lord. You can't live that way. You can't be in Christ and continue in sin. If you live in sin, you don't know Jesus. It's the way G, the Apostle Paul, or I mean the Apostle John says. He actually says, if you live in sin, then you're a liar if you say you love God. He's pretty blunt about it. One of the things he talks about near the end of the letter, and, and actually in this verse as well, is he talks about fellowship. He says that we have fellowship with God, and you have fellowship with us. Now one of the things that this virus has really made a wreck of is fellowship, isn't it? The times to get together, to have dinners together, the hugs, the handshakes, the time to mingle and talk. Uh, even for families over the holidays, it was difficult for them to get together. This virus has just torn apart fellowship. But it was so important to John. If you have an experience with God, you want to be with others that love God as well. You want to fellowship with them. And you're drawn together into a body of Christ. And you have fellowship with God at the same time. You have fellowship with each other. That's an important theme in this book. And so he talks about a fellowship. And he also talks about the experience, the importance of experiencing God yourself. Now you can experience God in a lot of different ways. You can watch the Jesus film. You can see what it was like. You can go to Sight and Sounds Theater and, and kind of experience it, you know, where the music and everything's all around you and experience that. And, and see what it was like for his Christ. You can get your Bible out and you can read it. And you can learn about Jesus Christ. You can come to church and you can worship and you can learn about Jesus Christ. But experiencing Jesus Christ in your life is much different than just learning about him. Having him in your heart as a Savior and Lord, Master of your life, experiencing his love, experiences his spirit in your life and his kindness, Having a first-hand experience, personal experience with God is a whole lot different than just knowing about Him. I mean, if you just know about Him, that's a second-hand experience. But you need to jump in 
and let him take your life. That's the only way you will know him. That's the only way he will be able to really live in your heart. And so if you want the eternal God, if you want to know the eternal God, you have to have a, a, a personal experience with him. It has to be a first-hand experience. It can't be second-hand through somebody else or anything else. You have to make that choice. Now in 1 John uh, chapter 3, 23, it says, and this is the command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. And that's kind of the heart of this letter, to believe in Jesus Christ. And you might remember in the Gospel of John, that is the one thing that he wants everyone to do, is to believe in Jesus Christ. And people who don't believe in Christ, that's where sin is. That's where sin is. But you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You have to have trust in Jesus Christ. You have to believe in Him. Trust Him with your life. And the, and the passage that Larry was talking about, God loved the world so much that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. You have to make that choice to believe in Him. That Jesus is the Son of God. That He's flesh and blood and God all at the same time. And if we believe in Jesus, then we follow his commandments. Now, it's really easy in the world to think sometimes that this is not important. To think that, you know, God's loving and kind. Certainly, he's going to overlook people who don't believe in him. Certainly, he's going to overlook people that maybe believe something else. And you kind of rationalize it and you say, maybe they grew up in a culture, in a world where they never had a chance to hear about it. There is no provision in the Bible that anyone who does not believe in Jesus ever gets to heaven, that ever is ever saved, that ever has God in their life. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the only way to believe and to follow. He's the only one to follow. He's the only thing. So that means that all of you have heard the most important truth in all the world. Now you can hear this truth and, and, and you can go to church all your life and yet maybe not quite be sure if you really believe it or not. You have to jump in. You have to take a step of faith and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord. It's not something you can prove scientifically. People have tried to do that throughout history. It always requires faith. It always requires belief to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. In 1 John 5, 13, it says, I write these things to you that you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may have eternal life. And so the reason this book is written is so, so that we will know about Jesus Christ, that we will believe in him, and that we will receive eternal life. That's the purpose. That's what John wants. He doesn't want people to be distracted. Don't listen to those people who say he really wasn't the Son of God. Don't listen to those people who say he wasn't the Savior, he wasn't the Messiah that the Old Testament was talking about. You need to keep your faith true in Jesus Christ. And that's the purpose of the book. Now through John, you can experience a lot about God. And you can read a lot about Him. And you can learn about what faith is. And you can learn about what light is. You can learn about what love is. But until you try it yourself, you really can't know God. Until you place your faith in Jesus Christ, God's Son, you really don't have this experience, do you? Now John's faith can help you. And John's faith might convince you, but John's commitment won't help you until you make a commitment of your own. John's teachings might help you understand, but you're the one who has to make the choice. You're the one who has to make the commitment. Until you decide to follow Jesus yourself, you will never know him. Christianity, Jesus, God will only be a second-hand experience to you. And you will only experience his love and his kindness secondhand through other people. If you want it yourself, you must jump in yourself. You must experience God for yourself. You must see, hear, touch, and know God. Now what will others see? What will they hear? What will they touch? When they know you, as they come into contact with you, what will they see, hear, and touch? Will they learn about God? Will they come to a greater understanding of God because of your life? 
Will you be the voice that they hear? Will you be the life that they watch? Will you be the one that hugs them and touches them when they need it? Will they learn about Jesus Christ through you, even though it's a second-hand experience? Will you be like the Apostle John writing this letter to their heart? When they see God in your life, will they begin to see that He's real and that they can have Him for their life as well? Or will Jesus remain for them only a second-hand experience? Will they experience God for themselves? Now, Jesus has placed us here in this world uh, to be His missionary, to be His person, to someone else, to be His witness, to someone else, to testimony. And so John says over and over again, what we have seen and heard, we testify about. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. And you and I need to do the same thing. So that those that we know and love around us, and even those we might, might not like so much, that they will have Jesus in their heart as well. And that they will have a first-hand experience with Jesus Christ, and not just know Him through second-hand. Let us pray. Father, four little verses this morning, and yet they have so much in them. And Father, this little book is like that all the way through, and don't let, ever let us underestimate it. Even though it's written so simply, it goes right to the heart of our life and the life of the world we live in today. It's, it's still every bit as relevant today as it was when it was written thousands of years ago. And Father, we thank you for this voice because we can hear your voice in it. In this scripture that we read, this, this letter, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, they become a witness to us, a proclamation to us about who you are. And that's the most important thing we can know in our life. And so, Father, I pray that this morning if somebody's heart has been stirred, and maybe it's the first time in their life they want to make a commitment to you because they want to know you firsthand. They want to have an experience with you and not just live, you know, by what others have said, but to live with you and powering their heart strengthening their heart, loving through them, Father, that you're the, the power in everything we do. We want to have that experience. Make it real to us. And never let us underestimate what it means when we dedicate our life to you and what you can do through us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.